Hello everyone, welcome back to another live stream. Thank you for everyone who has been waiting for me and thank you for everyone joining in. In this live stream tonight, I have a very interesting uh, subject to speak with you about, which is the unprecedented attempts from Israel to silence social media following their approval of silencing the news networks in Israel that can potentially harm Israel's security. Now, if you haven't watched my previous video that I posted earlier tonight, I recommend you go ahead and watch it after this live stream. I spoke about many different uh, things that are very important. I spoke about the Al-Shifa massacre revelations, 400 bodies so far found in Al-Shifa hospital and the tragedies are being revealed bit by bit. And I also spoke about the unprecedented protests in Israel, calls for Benjamin Netanyahu to resign and him having further feuds with the negotiating delegation with the head of the Mossad and the Israeli Shabak and him not allowing them to reach conclusions and deals. So one of the things that the protesters in Israel were very angry about are reports in the Israeli media that the head of the Mossad and the head of the Shabak, they agreed on a deal. But Benjamin Netanyahu refused it. Why? Because to him, they don't understand Hamas. Only he understands Hamas. No one understands Hamas but Benjamin Netanyahu. You'd think uh, if he understands Hamas so well, why was taking him so long to defeat them, right? So that was another thing that I spoke about. You can obviously again watch it in detail after this live stream, but if you have watched it already and you have any questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them and elaborate further. Any other relevant updates, of course. And I also spoke about the is further Israeli bullying, really. We're used to them bullying with them assassinating a key figure in the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps, Al-Quds Force, in the Iranian consulate in Damascus, near the Iranian embassy, which could potentially lead to more escalation and increased response from Iran, really, because of the level of the attack. Now let's get into the subject tonight. I'll try and make it as brief as possible. Obviously, this topic um, is very crucial at the moment. Israel is on an unprecedented mission, unprecedented Hasbara attack. For those of you who don't know what Hasbara means, it literally means explanation in Hebrew. But it's a term used for Israel to describe its propaganda arms. Propaganda, Israeli Hasbara. Many of you are familiar with this term. So today we had the legislation passing to ban any news network that can potentially harm Israel's security. However, in case you haven't noticed, some things are changing online, on social media. So you have the TikTok potential banning in the US and maybe other countries as well. You have some people who promote certain causes online, on different social media platforms, all of a sudden you can't see them. When you've been seeing them day by day, all of a sudden they don't show up on your feed. There's a reason behind that. LinkedIn is one of them, not just TikTok. So TikTok, you obviously have the attempts to ban. Zionist lobby is behind that. You need to understand this. Because it's primarily led by the increase in the pro-Palestine movement simply because it's organic. There's no manipulation, right? If you leave the people to it, 99% of the population in the world will tell you I'm with Palestine. No propaganda, no fear, no uh, misinformation, no pseudo narrative. Okay, that's with TikTok, proper banning, silencing, talk about freedom of expression. LinkedIn, I know some of you are not on LinkedIn. In case you have been on LinkedIn, 
98% of uh, people are posting on Palestine. No one's posting about business. Palestine, Palestine, Palestine. Some people are focusing only on LinkedIn, business people and whatever. Some of them were forced out of their uh, jobs. People need to understand that. And they posted about them being Muslim. Just around a week ago, all of a sudden, the number goes down from like 98% to 50, 40%. Where, where do these people go? Well, they're reporting what's happening to them. They're being banned from posting. All of a sudden, uh, pro-Israeli posts start popping up. People you've never heard of, never followed, who have no so sort of backing whatsoever in terms of organic following, right? Or people supporting their content. All of a sudden, they're pushed <clears throat> into your feed. Although people will <laughs> report them and all of the comments you'll see are against them and what they're promoting. Again, that's not something that happens for no reason. Obviously, Facebook and Instagram, they, when, well, since, ever since they started really and um, Facebook took over Instagram, they've had an anti-Palestinian sentiment. And I remember the early days of Facebook, 2005, 2006. Now, obviously, you have more and more people, shadow banned. Then you have YouTube, right? All of a sudden, people telling me here, number one, I'm getting unsubscribed. Can't see your videos anymore. You're not showing up on my feed. And obviously, it's not just me, but I'm one of them, right? It's important for people to know that. It's not coming out of nowhere. It's coming from a deliberate campaign, the biggest campaign in Israeli history. Now, let me give you a bit of numbers, okay? Officially, there's a Hasbara office in Israel. That is not, that's just a front, Okay, they have a budget of it was 10 million shekels, which is approximately three million dollars before the 7th of October. After the 7th of October, it bounced up to 63 million shekels, which is closer to 20 million dollars. However, that's just the office. That's the functionality of the office. Most of the money, over 95 percent of the money is not declared. Why? Because it's a network. It's a network of Israeli companies, shell companies, front media companies, Zionist organizations depicting themselves as something else in the US and worldwide. And some of that budget comes from the Israeli Mossad. Now the Israeli Mossad they don't declare their budget. However, very conservative estimates say that last year it was 3 billion US dollars. Again, it's not just about that. If you take, for example, the, the Super Bowl advertisement as uh, supporting Israel, 30 seconds. 30 seconds, $7 million. So hold on a second. If the office budget, it's Hasbara technically, but if the Israeli official office budget is 20 million US dollars, will you pay 7 million for 30 seconds? Of course not. That's nothing. These people are putting money in unprecedented numbers in term, in the forms of, you need to understand, it's not like they're li li directly buying people. Some people are bought, yes. But you're talking about investors, companies, donations, all of these things combined, not just one thing. And the example of the Super Bowl, although it's not directly linked to social media, but this gives you a glimpse of what happens in social media, proves that the number is way, way, way higher than the official figure that we're talking about. Now, why are they doing this? They've always done it, but why are they doing this now? And are the billions that I'm talking about exaggerated? Well, I'll tell you one thing. 
one office member of the Hasbara, who had a marketing company in Israel, he had an interview on Israeli television approximately in 2021. He sent a message to the government saying we need at least 1 billion shekels to run Hasbara properly. Obviously, he wants to make money, but he said it and this uh, figure wasn't like uh, challenged, by the way. So the people who were speaking with him, they kind of understood it correctly. 1 billion. And that's over two years ago, three years ago. Israel was nowhere near in the position it's at at the moment. All of the world is against them. So you have an unprecedented situation and you have unprecedented attempts to silence everyone, shadow ban them, ban them as much as possible, simply for promoting the truth. Nothing to do with the anti-Semitism, reporting what's happening telling people what's happening. This is why they killed over 130 reporters in Gaza, journalists. 130 journalists in under six months they assassinated in Gaza. Why did they assassinate them? Obviously they'll tell you, oh, they're members of Hamas. Yeah, of course, but everything is a member of Hamas. The birds in Gaza are members of Hamas. Everything is a member of Hamas. The sand is a member of Hamas. This is what they'll tell you, obviously. But the truth is they don't want the truth to get out there. That's why they also passed the law with massive majority, by the way, 73 to 10. Imagine. Imagine the number banning any news network that harms the security of Israel. Talk about freedom. Of press, which reminds us of what Yair Lapid, the opposition leader in Israel, who spent over 20 years, two decades as a journalist before he entered politics, what he said in the beginning of this genocide. Hmm? The media cannot be objective. Being objective serves the Hamas. That's their rationale. That's their argument. Being objective saying things as they are, telling you my point of view, regardless of anything, yeah, is serving Hamas. As if everyone in the world is ideologically linked, right? So, the, so it's either our truth or Hamas. Either lies or you're Hamas. Similar to Bush in, in, in 2000, you either, you're either with us or you're with the terrorists. No, no middle ground. If you're criticizing what we're doing, you were the terrorists. So this was the main thing that I want to talk to you about, really, so that you're well informed. I've noticed the suspicious things changing in the past couple of weeks. But after conducting research across multiple social media platforms, it appears to be a well-coordinated, well-organized, heavily funded campaign to silence as much as possible and hopelessly, by the way, try and promote Israeli propaganda. And this campaign won't last for long, by the way, because the they will run out at the end of the day. You, you can't constantly keep pushing for it because you need to understand lots of these things, they depend on bidding, right? Similar to how you want to go on uh, Google SEO, go front page on Google. It's the highest bidder. What's your budget? How much do you want to spend? For how long? So they're trying it. Obviously, they had attempts before, but now they're trying it on a very massive scale. But let me tell you one thing. They will fail. And they can't silence people. And people are awake. That's the thing. I mean, even with some of these posts that I was looking at, uh, people responding to these promotions, these pathetic lies, as, come on, you're not, are you, do you think you're going to fool us? Hardly any likes, hardly anything to do with them. And do you think you can fool us? <laughs> but, but by actually showing me this and my when I'm not interested in these people and people who constantly post and talk and report all of a sudden don't see them anymore. What do you think people are stupid? That's it. It's open now. You either declare authoritarianism 
and police state and an Orwellian state. Either do that or you're with freedom, freedom of thought. And let Israel talk. Let them talk. Let, let, let people listen. Let people listen to everyone. This is our position. Why? Because we're morally consistent. We're morally consistent when we believe in a virtue, in a moral, in something. It's consistent. It's not blind. It's not selective. Unlike the other side, everything is selective. What I'm allowed to do, you're not allowed to do. That's what they want, dictatorship, authoritarianism. They thrive in the dark. We thrive in the light. That's why we want the light. And let everyone see everything as it is. And come and challenge me. Talk. Present your point of view. And I will present mine. And let people judge. I don't want you to believe me. You be the judge. Make your own judgment. I'm not here for approval personally or people agreeing. You make your judgment. But we need to talk. This is a freedom of expression that they're brutally against, by the way. But again, like I said, this campaign won't be lasting for very long. And it's yet another desperate attempt. Shows how frustrated they are, how miserably failing their campaign is, and how clear the truth is. This was the main thing that I want to talk to you about. And I'll open the space up for all of you to uh, join in the conversation. I'll try and address obviously as much as possible. And thank you for everyone joining us, by the way, for everyone who's joining us. Uh, this live stream is primarily for the viewers, subscribers, members to share their thoughts, views, questions, of course. And I will uh, be more than happy to uh, address as much as possible from them regardless if they're linked with this uh, subject or anything that I spoke about before, general, or general stuff as well. Terry Lynn Nelson, thank you for your membership, uh, Terry. Uh, shutting Al Jazeera scares me. They are the main source of information about Gaza and the West Bank. Yes, and they've been doing a great job for a very long time. Now, let me tell you one thing about the enforcement and everything. Israel will have no problem in immediately shutting down Al Jazeera in Israeli territories. Technically, even though Israel is occupying everything now, but non-West Bank, non-Gaza. They will have a bigger problem in Gaza and in the West Bank. They would be able to enforce the action, but they would have a bigger problem because there is more freedom, more complications when it comes to these areas. Second thing, you're talking about shutting down the main offices. You could still have people reporting in, sending you stuff. Right. As a matter of fact, they can be in a better position and have more freedom because all of Al Jazeera reporters in Israel are very, very muted. And I know that personally from people directly who I've seen in Israel, they are very much under control. If there's war, they're recording something, landing somewhere. They won't show it. They have Israel to approve it. And during this genocide, Israel bullied and threatened reporters. Like one of them was uh, from Al Arabi. Uh, he had a, a police officer coming to him, threatening him physically, intimidating him. Even though he press, reporter, he has the approvals, has everything. So that doesn't mean they will totally cease to function, although that's a very big possibility because that's what happened with Al Mayadeen. That's run by previous staff who worked in Al Jazeera, by the way. No Shamrock for Genocide Joe is saying it's becoming depressing. Egypt needs to open the gates and let people out for free they have trapped the civilians in hell both israeli 
and Middle East countries should be ashamed of themselves. I totally understand this notion. However, my only comment on that personally, I would say open the gates completely for everything that the civilians need. Take the people who are unable to be treated in Gaza. I agree with that. Opening the gates completely for everyone to flee. This is what Israel wants. This is Israel's plan. This is what Israel's been frustrated most from Egypt that they haven't allowed them to do that. Why? Because if they do open it, look at what happened in 1948. This is how Israel ethnically cleansed the Palestinians and implemented Plan Dalit. 750,000. What do you think? They told them you're never going to come back. Is Zionist militia soldiers were telling them, go flee, otherwise you'll die, there's a war. Then you can come back. Try to come back. Shot. I live there. Kill them on the borders. You're not allowed to come back. All of their properties in Israeli law called the ownership, the ownership of the missing, right? So they take control because the people are missing. They're not missing. They're a few miles down in Lebanon and Syria and Jordan. And you made them refugees and you're forcing them out and you expel them and you won't allow them back in. So... Uh, this is what they want with Gaza. I would say open for the people who cannot be medically treated because Israel ruined all of the hospitals now in Gaza with the latest abhorrent crime against humanity, the lowest of the lows that humanity can reach. They dipped below that. Imagine the lowest pit of humanity. They dug in a tunnel straight through and, and dip. this is what they've done in Al Shifa Hospital. Bodies decomposing in chains. Women raped, pregnant women raped in front of their families. And they're putting a gun on the family, the male family members. If they shut their eyes, they'll shoot them so they can see what's happening. Imagine what, we, what you're talking about. Imagine the levels that are happening. So people like that, they cannot be treated in Gaza, treat them in Egypt. There's already approximately, there's tens of thousands already being treated in Egypt anyway. And some of them go to other countries like Turkey and Qatar and other countries to uh, be treated. And Israel has, and Egypt has field hospitals in Sinai to treat Palestinians. But opening it to everyone, will be the biggest service for Israel. And I know that's complicated, but in terms of the aid, yeah, absolutely, you need to open it completely, regardless of what Israel thinks, in terms of quantities, everything. But again, you're seeing also Israel, what they're doing, the bombing the aid trucks, bombing everything, not allowing anything to the northern parts of Gaza, people living on nothing. So getting a meal, in North Gaza is an accomplishment. One meal, if you get one meal, you've done a massive accomplishment. Four or five people from the same household will share it. Up until three, four days, till they find another meal. Famine, deliberate, war crime. Let's go to your next uh, questions or comment here. Enrique Verona, Palestinians will win this. Remember the Taliban defeated the US, have faith and fight. That's a very good example. And a very good example of how gullible and ignorant people are as well. Some people to say the least. They went there without Taliban doing anything, by the way, to them. 
and bin laden denied any involvement in 9 11 anyway from taliban and taliban told the us at the time we're willing to coordinate with you if you provide evidence that he did such and such because we don't allow any attacks on foreign nations from our country and respect international countries and their sovereignty but they went in because they wanted to fight terrorists with beards and turbans in the Tora Bora mountains. And people were around, yeah, yeah, fight the baddies, yeah, kill the baddies. This is what they used to say at the time. And all of a sudden they left. And they got the same baddies they were speaking about within a second. But that's fine, you know, no one's questioning it. So they can go kill a million, a million and a half, destroy countries, and then decide, you know what, it's enough of that. For whichever reason, by the way. There's drugs, there's strategies, there's geopolitical stuff. There's lots of things, by the way. The CIA used to take heroin in, in tens of tons in their airplanes to the U.S., in case you don't know. <clears throat> Poppy seeds. But, yes, you have faith and you you don't have an option, really. Do you have another option but to fight? If you're in Gaza, you have no option because they're killing you anyway. Fighting and not fighting. You're dead anyway. 33,000 people. You you see, the if you monitor, you see how many people they executed literally for doing nothing. And that's just what's recorded. So you're dying anyway. It's not like you're safe if you don't fight. <laughs> they don't have any other option. No shamrock for genocide. Joe Hasbara doesn't work in Ireland. We've heard it all before. I'm glad to hear that, but I think it's failing across the world now, isn't it? It's failing everywhere. And it's just a desperate attempt with all of their, um, with all of the money they're spending now. Let's go to your uh, next question. Okay, we have... Um, okay, did Russia provide S-300 Syrian co uh, coordinates to Israel? I'm not sure if they still have the S-300 because there was a report last two years ago that they took away the S-300. Syria so still has some. They might have them under Russian operation. So they can operate them, not the Syrians. Uh, the Syrians, however, they do have SA-20 and other systems, uh, not as advanced as S-300. But uh, they're fully in coordination with Russia, of course, when it comes to that. <clears throat> Helen McMillan, thank you for your membership, Helen. Faith is evident in the people of Palestine. But how do the survivors of Al-Shifa go on living without despair or broken spirit and heart? How likely are they to live without murderous anger? Look, absolutely. I mean, I, I'm a believer, right? I think there's definitely divine help, undeniably. But it's also due to human adaptability. We adapt as human beings. You'd think how many, like the, when I was looking through uh, the reports in Al-Shifa to review exactly what happened and just see exactly what happened before I talk about it, there was this man holding his phone and going around like, so yeah, this is how the bodies are decomposing. This is the example that you have here in the bodies lying next to him and he's saying it and people are walking. Do you understand the level of what's happening? It became normal to see these things. It became normal to hear bombs 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 times an hour, day and night. 
see bodies everywhere and and body parts and decomposing and smell going out and can you th can you imagine that and unfortunately fortunately but fortunately too people can get used to these things as bad as they are right that's what's happening plus what other options do they have and let me remind you of one thing here it's about the spirit of the people too they don't have to be in north gaza the half million or so who are in north gaza some people say 300,000 some people say up to 7 800,000 let's say half a million are still in north gaza they don't have to be there they know they can go down to the south of Gaza and have more access to some aid. Obviously, not be totally safe because nowhere is totally safe, but they can have access to something. They would rather go starving with nothing. No clothes, nothing to sleep on, no food, in despair, hunger, but they don't want to leave. Why? Because they know if they leave, they will most likely not be allowed to return and Israel wants to expel them from their lands. And it's a population which prior to the 7th of October consisted of 73% of the people. They were refugees. Refugees, made refugees by Israel. They were expelled from their homes in 1948 and 1967. So they've tasted the bitterness of being a refugee from your own land during the Nakba of 1948 and the Naksa of 1967. Had 750,000 refugees in 48, a further 300,000 in 67. Apart from individual cases, but that's the mass numbers. So they know, <laughs> I'm going out, I'm not gonna come back. And this is proving to be one of the most crucial points during the negotiations, by the way, that Hamas is not backing off from allowing the people to North Gaza to a level where Israel admitted the delegation, the negotiating delegation. They said, we don't understand why Hamas is being so stubborn and persistent on letting all of the civilian population go back to the North of Gaza. We don't understand they're persistent. It's because they know you. It's because they know what you've done. It's because they're refugees. And they know that when Israel forces you out, they don't allow you in, but they would allow radical psychopathic settlers in. This is what they would allow. So um, that's, that's uh, how it is really, the spirit of the people, the divine intervention and the adaptability. Sailor Jerry Swallow, I had to resubscribe again today. Yeah, uh, I told YouTube about this. Oh, they told me we have a technical issue. Seems like the technical issues are growing, right? But you have to continuously tell the people about it. Let's go to your next um, comment or question. And greetings, obviously, to everyone joining us and everyone greeting as well. JR, Israel believes it can defeat God. <laughs> They don't believe in him, but they believe in selective promises that he apparently made. You know, as if God is your servant or your estate agent, <laughs> sitting there passing estates and lands to people. Oh, that's your why? Because you're my chosen people. <clears throat> but they are delusional. They're, they're psychopathic. That's uh, definite.
Okay, let me see if you have any more questions. If anyone has any, obviously, comments or questions, you can drop them below. Uh, Grandma K, are Syria, Lebanon, others questioning why American bombs are raining down on them? Are the countries and organizations that help to build hospitals and organizations in Gaza upset about what Israel is destroying? Look, Syria, Lebanon, and the Arab states that did not fully go ahead and comply with the U.S. interest-led situation, they know how the U.S. is what the U.S. is about and how the United States pushes its agenda in the region through violence and death and destruction. They've seen that for decades. So it's not something new on them. They know that very well. Russia knows that very well. That's why they have a level of coordination and that's why this coordination is expanding. Are the countries and organizations that help build hospitals and organizations in Gaza upset about what Israel is doing? Absolutely. And they're talking about it. And they're vocal. But you're not hearing it on mainstream media. Why? Because mainstream media is a brainwashing tool to make you a compliant idiot. They want to make you an ignorant, compliant idiot who knows nothing and only conforms to the status quo that the powers that be want. That's why they won't say any. That's why we have more work to do. That's why if I had all of the time in the world, I'll be speaking to you 24-7. Because there's so much not being spoken about Although we were six months in, this is what's baffling here. We're six, half a year into this genocide and some of them are still trying to hide things. It's unreal. And by the way, those who are not, just to save face, just to show that, oh, okay, in case we uh, something goes to the ICJ, we weren't compliant with uh, this genocide and we kind of uh, saved our backs a little bit. But they are. How many people in the UN are talking? The chief himself, Guterres, how much is he talking? All the time. Many people. But you don't constantly hear that. Because they want to save this genocidal state's face. Although it's, uh, it's not possible, really. It isn't possible. But they're still trying to. <clears throat> That's the situation that you have. I have a question from Gulliberg. Have you heard of the U.S. building an airbase on the Yemeni island of uh, Socotra? That's the first time I'm hearing it from you. But even if they do build it, I'm not sure how effective it would be. The Yemeni resistance, they are shutting down the Red Sea. They are expanding their operation to South Africa and the Indian Ocean. You have an increased coordination and cohesion between China, Russia, and Yemen more countries could potentially follow. So I'm not sure how effective it is. All of their air bases and bases in the Middle East are vulnerable, extremely vulnerable, from small resistance groups, by the way, let alone countries and states. So what are they gonna do exactly? What, put a thousand uh, uh, puppet soldiers there? A thousand um, cannon fodder soldiers? who are uh, ignorant enough to go and serve because you have also people in America are waking up. It's not just the Israeli soldiers waking up. Aaron Bushnell is a massive example of this. And then you had many more veterans speaking up and uh, criticizing the US role. Eileen Strange, sorry to be late, not a problem dear, welcome. 
I heard that Egyptian troops may be coming into Gaza as peacekeepers. Do you know anything about this? Yes, I know a thing or two about this. Firstly, Israel said repeatedly that we have Arab states that showed willingness to have a, keep, a peacekeeping force in Gaza. But they didn't say, who are they? Who are these Arab states? Initially, everyone would think immediately, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Egypt. Saudi Arabia denied, Jordan denied, and Egypt denied. They said bluntly and clearly, we're not sending ground troops to Gaza on any mission. Hamas also spoke. We will treat any foreign force not going into Gaza through the resistance as an occupation force. This is what they've done with this traitor Palestinian force that came through, what's his name? Majid Faraj, the head of the Palestinian intelligence, disguised as the Egyptian Red Crescent. Imagine these people supporting a genocidal state against their own people at their hardest time. But if Israel is failing to say who, which countries are going to be included in this force, then there's nothing. Then they're just selling us a lie. Tell us, who, who are they? And, and how are you going to try and convince them to come in? I'm sorry, but your own army doesn't want to fight this war. The majority of your population are against this war now, including veterans, including anyone, people from the intelligence and military community telling you, we can't win this war. You had officials in the Israel intelligence establishment, and I spoke about many of them in my previous videos, if you want to go back to them, who said we either agree to a deal that Sinwar dictates or we can't do anything. The head of the Mossad said, if we continue down this path, we're doomed. People in the military intelligence directorate were unable to completely achieve full victory in this war. So <clears throat> who's going to come and fight from abroad? <clears throat> Julio Acosta, Mahmoud, brother, do you have any news about Israel bombed Iran embassy in Syria today? Thank you, brother for informing us all about this madness that will happen in the Middle East. No problem. My pleasure. Thank you. And it wasn't the embassy. We spoke about it in my previous video. It was the consulate that was near the embassy. So in legal terms, it doesn't fall under the definition of sovereign soil. And Israel took that into consideration. Not that they really care, but they took that into consideration. And although not all countries regard foreign missions, such as embassies, as sovereign foreign soil, by the way, but it's protected by the Geneva Convention. It's protected by international law. So there's a difference between a consult and an embassy. They killed, obviously... Um, a uh, senior figure in the IRGC Quds Force, which is in charge of the overseas operations of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Corps, or Al-Quds Force, of course, it's part of the IRGC, alongside eight other people, typical, entitled Israel, killing anyone uh, that deems to be a threat to them. Not that they succeeded in stopping anything, really but just highlights the hypocrisy and blindness and the uh, lawless state that the world is in. And thank you everyone uh, contributing with your uh, comments <clears throat> and greetings. Let's go to Uh, the next uh, question or comment. Mm. Colin Mansell, can you explain how the flow of aid and assistance for Palestinians is throttled and which party or parties are responsible for the lack of flow of aid? Okay, so traditionally you have the Rafah border 
and you have multiple crossings from Israel into Gaza. On a normal day, so no 7 October, no nothing, the aid goes in, reaches the authorities in Gaza, governed by Hamas, or the international organizations, primarily the UNRWA, and then it gets delivered. Israel wants to undermine Hamas and wants to kill the UNRWA. Why? So that they can make Gaza uninhabitable. So, so, so people need to understand this concept that Israel doesn't want any aid in, but it's just pushing what's kind of um, very, very minimal to make some people alive. So they took down the UNRWA almost completely. You have Hamas. They are after Hamas. Civil Hamas, uh, military Hamas, everything Hamas. So they need a third party. They tried to reach an agreement with some of the tribes in Gaza, tribe leaders that will give you aid. You distribute it. Because they directly, they don't want to distribute anything. As far as they're concerned, they'll bomb the aid trucks. So it still gets through where Israel allows it to, unless they attack it, like in the northern parts of Gaza. <clears throat> through some of these tribes in Gaza and Hamas. One big reason that they attacked Al-Shifa is because Al-Shifa, one of the police officers in Hamas, who was able to get 14 aid trucks into North Gaza, clearly by working his way around the aid going through a side that seems to be collaborating or uh, fined by Israel to the people, he managed to get the aid in. They killed him. And they massacred the population later on. So from their perspective, they don't want Hamas delivering the aid. The main obstacle in the whole aid situation is Israel because they have an option to open all of the borders, right? But they don't want Hamas to have any sort of good image with the population. The lack of flow is the occupation, is Israel. So the main contributor and the main culprit is Israel, not allowing the trucks in. When they go in, they harass them and bully them and kill them and target them, and they completely ban them from multiple parts of Gaza. Now, this situation creates havoc. And you will start having people trying to profiteer. This is something that, again, Hamas works on preventing. One of the people who was working on preventing this is the man that Israel assassinated two weeks ago because he had good connections with everyone in the north. And they obviously told people who try and kind of get a lot of aid and then try and resell it because you'll have people going in from warning them from doing so because the aid is meant for the population. But the number one party in charge of all of this is Israel. John Klein, have you had the opportunity to look into a Discord channel yet? Not yet. I know. I think it was you or someone else um, suggested this. I, I will look into it definitely at some point. <clears throat> okay. Mm. Eileen Strange, second question. Do you think that Israelis are they threatening the Egyptians with bombing Cairo if they open the border to the aid trucks? That's a very interesting question. And I think many people don't think the way you do. And it's important to think that because there's definite pressure. There's definite threat. 
if you want to talk about Israel using nuclear weapons, it's easier for them to nuke Cairo. It's impossible to nuke Gaza because they would nuke themselves. But they can drop a nuclear bomb on Cairo. Plus, all of their pressure was happening just before Egypt joined the BRICS. Egypt also was thinking, I want to go ahead with the BRICS thing. I don't want to do something that will push towards uh, completely exploding that option. That obviously doesn't justify their position in still being compliant with Israel's request with the Rafah border. Because don't forget, they're already non-compliant when it comes to the peace treaty. An Israeli official from the military, military intelligence directorate, I quoted him when I posted a video about the Egyptian tunnels a couple of months ago. He said that Egypt broke every line of the peace treaty. They have tunnels, they have attack tunnels in Sinai, they have forces in Sinai, they have heavy equipment in Sinai. All, it should be a demilitarized zone. <clears throat> Again, why? Because Israel has potential plans to reoccupy it. So that's definitely something that they would consider. They know their vulnerabilities. Uh, but again, at least with the humanitarian side, although they always deny the, that they, you know, ban aid from going in, they're still adhering to um, what uh, their agreement with Israel. Uh, Mona Nasrallah, please explain uh, to your viewers the difference between Hamas, Fatah, Palestinian, Islamic resistance. Uh, the main difference is the ideology. Obviously, Fatah was the original movement that led the Palestinian revolution in the 60s. It consisted of people with Muslim Brotherhood ideologies. Then it had multiple splits, but primarily following the Oslo Accords and people who did not agree with the path that they chose of full diplomacy with Israel and stopping the armed resistance. Uh, Hamas are Muslim Brotherhood ideology, but they split from the Muslim Brotherhood leadership from Egypt because when they wanted to engage in more armed resistance or in armed resistance against Israel and they consulted the leadership of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt they told them it's not the time therefore they said to us it is the time so they had this organizational split however the ideology is there it again influences like the PIJ similar ideological uh, backgrounds but obviously as with any ideology, they will have different interpretations. They will, they are dynamic at times and change, but they're more uh, Muslim Brotherhood ideology in its origin. However, obviously, they change some of their uh, stances and positions uh, sometimes. But the main thing is really the ideology, more nationalist, pan Arabist ideology. Uh, for Fatah and Hamas more an Islamic ideology and you obviously have other groups that have like socialist ideologies in terms of the resistance you have the PFLP the uh, DFLP um, People's Party stuff like that uh, but when it comes to the resistance really uh, it's primarily led by Hamas and the PIJ You have the PFLP, you have a couple from Fatah in lesser numbers. Gregory, thank you. Gregory Theodore. Okay.
Mariam Masoud, Human Rights Watch, made a post recently saying Taliban have declared they will be stoning women for zina. Interesting to see that they didn't mention the law that applies to men too. Hasbara going hard. Yeah, I mean, typical, really. They focus on what they want to focus on. <laughs> Not that I agree with the worldview of Taliban. But uh, Taliban didn't kill 32,000 civilians. And women. Talk about women's rights, right? All of the people acting like feminists and women's rights. So tell me about the women in Gaza. Tell me about them and what they're facing. Rape, humiliation, nothing in terms of medical support. Women who are vulnerable, deprived from learning, from studying, from food. Women, this, women. That's if you want to talk just about women. I'm, I'm not a fan of the woman-man thing, by the way. We're human beings who are dignified and who should have access to equal rights. Simple. Hmm? But for those who like to split, right? women's rights and men's rights and you have rights universal rights give them to everyone but again selective right selective they you know whatever suits them the typical narrative and as long as it's uh, related with islam amazing beautiful we'll focus on it we'll highlight it, highlight it more talk to me about your what your genocidal state does to women Uh, Shannon L, I already spoke about the uh, Iranian embassy. If you go back to um, if you go back to the beginning of the video, but it wasn't the embassy; it was a consulate, and eight people were killed, including one senior figure in the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Guards Corps Quds Force, particularly. Mm. Ashkiro Moksi, and now that the Turkish local elections are over, do you think Erdogan will intervene in Gaza like McGregor is predicting after Ramadan? He said after, you know, obviously he supports verbally and he supports the Palestinian resistance and verbally and this and that. But in the beginning of the war, he said, we have an option, we, we will, at some point, we're ready to participate militarily. Hinting that he might take some action. We haven't seen anything. That probably uh, pushed more people to vote for Imamoglu and the CHP. Will he do that to boost his um, position? Too risky only for um, political purposes. Plus, he's been there for 21 years now. He's done amazing things for Turkey, by the way. But he's been there for 21 years. And uh, some people who were with him from the early days started to shift away slightly, slowly, but surely. Like one of them was Dawit Oglu, who was the foreign minister. He was one of his closest people, split from him. And making statements that are too flashy without substance, that doesn't help him. Didn't help him, clearly didn't help him in these elections. Will he do something drastic, preparing for, look, we had a general election last year, right? So there's still time for him in power. Uh, I don't think that's going to be um, a thing that he will do for his image or what have you. The only time I personally think Turkey will intervene militarily is when Turkey is under threat.
Uh, Omar Zakut is saying Turkey is focused on preserving economic ties. Egypt is building a new capital city for like 60 billion and Saudi is building the line. If they cut economic ties, it could disrupt their future plans. That could be linked to, that could be linked to, but I think if it was, even if they didn't have these plans, they're still taking the same traditional positions that they took previously. As a matter of fact, like if you talk about 50 years ago, at least, the Saudi position was better. So, but I mean, in the last few decades, it's not like things have changed massively and they didn't always have these uh, campaigns going on. Let's go to your next uh, comment or question. Dato Miko, thank you. Uh, Kate is saying PA formed new government, including Gaza. What happened to Hamas? Now, this new government is just a visual move, really. It's the prime minister position of the West Bank, which means nothing, really. I mean, the, the whole the whole government in the West Bank is a puppet government for Israel. So appointing someone that doesn't mean anything. What happens in Gaza is what the people of Gaza want and will want in the future. They cannot be forced into agreeing to have someone coming on tanks, let alone a genocide. Antonia P.I. Resistance and warfare require means of communication that are safe and secure. The resistance in Gaza must have great communication systems. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Great communication systems, great logistic support, great supply lines, great intelligence, great freedom of movement, great protection to a very high degree. Absolutely. And again, you know, I must reiterate this. Ever, ever since the 7th of October, ever since the operation began, Al-Aqsa flood, they spinned it from day one. The operation began by Hamas taking down the Gaza division, one of the most sophisticated divisions in the Israeli army surrounding Gaza and with the task of making sure everything in, in Gaza is in check. It was, it took them four hours to take them down. No one talked about it on mainstream media. No one spoke about Hamas targeting the Israeli military. No one. No one spoke about the fact that Hamas kidnapped Israeli soldiers and commanders in their, in their underpants. No one spoke about that. What did they speak about? 40 beheaded babies, lie. Raped women, lie. The massacres in the Nova Festival and the kibbutzes, Israel committed them, proven by Israel. And they still spin it to this day. Oh, what happened on the 7th of October is atrocious and this and that. Israel killed the majority of its citizens. Hamas conducted a military operation against the Israeli army. They did not deliberately target civilians. And then you have Israel deliberately targeting civilians, deliberately targeting infrastructure, destroying hospitals, you know, babies in incubators, every, every single thing under the sun. And they don't say anything about the accomplishment of the resistance to this day. And to some people, it's still hidden. And, and you really need to be very, very ignorant for, for that to pass on you like that, by the way. Haven't the people asked themselves the basic question, why has Israel not accomplished this war, this genocide yet? Why did they not annihilate Hamas yet? What's happening? Why? Because of the Palestinian armed resistance. 
That's the main thing stopping them. But they won't talk about it. That's why. They're unable to complete a genocide because of the Palestinian resistance. This shows very high level of sophistication, very advanced means, high, high, intense levels of preparation, determination, everything, including the communication to this day. Although Israel is destroying whatever it wants to destroy, really, in Gaza. They, they have, they're given a free hand from the U.S., to destroy everything that they want. And they're still failing. Mona Nasrallah, thank you for giving a platform, for having a platform that speaks the truth regardless of where people stand. Thank you for tuning in. Pleasure. You're not going to agree with everyone, are you? It's not about agreeing, by the way. <clears throat> it's about speaking, debating, revealing things that are not being spoken about. As long as we all have a respectful, you know, tone and, and different opinions, perfect. Okay. War and fire. Lots of people keep repeating Israel created Hamas and unfortunately it keeps getting new life. Yeah, this notion is wrong. At one point, Israel thought if Hamas becomes stronger, it could negatively affect Fatah, which was the bigger force at the time. But Hamas was an organic movement that grew from within the Palestinian people. What Israel did do is they successfully split Gaza and the West Bank. That's why they don't want the, this is what people need to understand too. That's why they also don't want Fatah to come back in its current form, but have rogue forces that are aligned with them ideologically to control Gaza. Because they don't want a united Gaza and the West Bank, because then they will have a better standing internationally to form a state that Israel does not want. Because Israel doesn't want a Palestinian state. That's why. But Hamas, they're a movement, obviously, Israel. Israel wanted to have them only in Gaza. They wanted to have something different than Fatah and Gaza, because don't forget, they tried to destroy Hamas multiple times before. Like after they won the elections, 2008, 2009, well, they were saying the same thing. We want to destroy them. Why would you want, you want to destroy them if you created them? You just didn't, didn't want anyone annoying you, right? But then they thought, if you can't beat them, make some deals. Start making some deals, try to destroy them again, 2014. They thought that Hamas would be happy with ruling Gaza. Hamas proved to them that they're not, that they're looking for the national Palestinian case as a whole. And they sacrificed themselves. Okay, let's see what else do we have. <clears throat> Shakti. Are the resistance fighters able to get food and medical aid? Look, everything is scarce now and that will obviously affect the resistance itself. And some of the Israeli <clears throat> prisoners who were held by the resistance in Gaza and then were later released, they described certain situations where they had medical aid treating them and treating 
the Palestinian resistance fighters at the same time. In one example given by one of the Israelis who was released, she said that one of the fighters was wounded but still protecting us. And the doctor was giving aid to me and then he later treated him. They will obviously have some sort of aid. However, the general situation will also affect them because obviously the supply is not indefinite for everything. But when you're talking about war, you know, people will have to deal with uh, very little amounts of, of everything. Okay, let's see if you have any more questions before we wrap up. No, that's pretty much it. Okay. Let's wrap it there, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for uh, joining me. Thank you for uh, all of your contributions. Chocolate pudding, thank you for your super thanks. I missed that. I'm just uh, seeing it now. You're asking me, can you recommend the charity organizations I wanted to donate during the Holy Week, but unfortunately I fell short. Look, I can't recommend uh, charity by name. What I will say and what I always say is do your checks on every charity you support. There are many good, legit charities that have work on the ground and that are very transparent. So check them, check their legitimacy, make sure their operation is right, the people are right, see proof of their uh, organizational capabilities and their delivery on the ground, and then support them. Don't, don't support any old, uh, old thing that you don't, haven't really checked. You have to check. You have to check. If I do collaborate at some point with a charity, I will obviously let you know. If we make a fundraiser, I did to be fair. I mean, some people I approach them, they don't get back. What can I do? But if I do, if someone does get back to me from these charities or uh, anyone relevant, I will obviously let you know and we can make a fundraiser uh, on the channel that will go directly to them. But there are more than enough uh, really organizations that um, that provide good services really and thank you so much for your uh, super thanks and uh, that was chocolate pudding for you and we will uh, wrap it here hopefully i'll be with you tomorrow as well i will uh, try and notify you during the day like uh, like i did today sometimes i notify you with the live stream by the way just like an hour before maybe sorry about that but I just work around my availability and my schedule. If I have the time during the day, I will inform you in advance and I will post during uh, the evening, right? Or during the day about the live stream. That's apart from my normal video. And by the way, I might be getting more things in during the day. If some of you are around during the daytime. I know you got accustomed to me during the night and depends on where you're, you are in terms of time zone. So if I post something during the day, if you're in America, you would see it very early in the morning. If you're on the East Coast, if you're on the West Coast, like uh, dawn time, really. If you're um, BST or GMT, 
it would be similar obviously because GMT here no BST now but yeah I might uh, I did publish a couple of videos earlier on during the day <clears throat> but might do a bit more of them to sometimes break the topics down but anyways thank you so much for uh, joining me everyone enjoy uh, your evening thank you so much for your comments everyone and I will see you in the next video. Take care.